nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. You can follow along with this presentation by going to nanohub.org and downloading the corresponding slides. Enjoy the show. Okay, welcome back and uh, thanks for hanging in there. One more lecture. So what, what I'm going to be talking about now is, is the general model for conduction that Professor Dada discussed in the first half of his talk. I'm going to go through it one more time. Uh, we'll do it slowly and I'll do one or two things just a little bit differently. I'll do it in a slightly different notation, but it's the form of the model that I'm going to use for the next eight lectures. So it's worth seeing it again and, and getting comfortable with it. So it's a general way to, to uh, think about transport. Okay, so here are the things we'll go through. And I'm going to begin by talking about a simple model device for a nano device. And we'll begin like this. So we'll think of the device. So the, the device is some material. This is like the channel of a field effect transistor or something. And it's characterized by a density of states, D. So, you know, that might come from a band structure of silicon, but it might come from a set of energy levels from a molecule. It can be any material that can conduct current. Okay, what we haven't got a device yet because we have to put contacts on the device. Okay, so we'll attach two contacts and uh, on the left and the right I have two contacts. The assumption is that these are large contacts with lots of inelastic scattering that maintain thermodynamic equilibrium. Of course things can't be exactly at thermodynamic equilibrium or there wouldn't be any current to flow, but it's very, very close, close enough. So F1 is the Fermi function of the left contact, F2 is the Fermi function of the right contact. The left contact is grounded, the voltage is zero, the right contact has a voltage V applied to it. Later on it'll have a, have a different temperature applied to it as well. Okay, so we describe both of those by a Fermi function because they're in equilibrium and I'll write the Fermi level as EF, not as mu because I'm I'm going to be following more standard electrical engineering terminology where mu is always the mobility. All right. So you have to keep that straight. So EF1 is the Fermi level of the left contact. EF2 is the Fermi level of the right contact. And it's different because an applied a positive voltage lowers the Fermi level. So EF2 is EF1 minus QV. That's what the voltage does. Okay, and we might have a gate. We might be trying to make a nanotransistor. We'd apply a voltage to the gate, and the gate voltage would change the potential inside the device. So it would change the self-consistent potential, that U, and that would just move the states up and down. That's how we'd make a transistor. We just move those energy states up and down with an external gate voltage. I'm actually not going to be talking about transistors in this talk, or in fact in any of the lectures. Uh, so um, you can make a nice little model for a nanotransistor with this model, but that's not what we're going to be talking about. And then finally we have to talk about the contacts. So the contacts are always important. So we need to specify the contacts somehow. The easiest way to specify contact is the contacts is in terms of these times. So if that's a small molecule and we put an electron there, it might take a time tau 1 to escape into contact 1. Or it might take a time tau 2 to escape into contact 2. You know? So we'll have to talk about exactly what, what those times are a little bit later. Uh, but we could also express them in terms of energy with this you know, it looks like an uncertainty relation. So gamma is the broadening, and it's h bar over tau. That just expresses those times in units of one over energy, or h bar over energy. Uh, if this were a molecule, then what gamma would correspond to is that if a molecule were isolated, its energy levels would be discrete. If a molecule is attached to the outside world, there'd be some finite lifetime of the electrons in those states, and the energy levels would broaden. That's why we call it the broadening. Okay, so current will flow in contact one and out 
or in, in the right contact, out the left contact. So we define it to be positive when it flows in the right contact. Okay, and then we begin by asking two questions. How is the number of electrons in the device related to the Fermi levels of those two contacts? And obviously it's gonna also be related to the density of states of that channel material as well, and to those characteristic times. And the second question is how is the current related to those same quantities? Those are, really, those are the two questions that we're asking today. So here's our device again. And now first of all, there are a few assumptions here that I just need to mention. So one is, I'm going to be describing this density of states or device by a band structure, an E of K. And for most of the lectures, I'm going to assume a parabolic band. Energy is h bar squared k squared over 2m. That's actually not necessary. No? All I need is a density of states. This might be a set of molecular levels. It might be an amorphous material or something else. We don't need a band structure, but for these lectures, we're going to assume we have a nanotube with a band structure, we have a piece of silicon with a band structure. We're gonna make that assumption, and I'll refer you to Professor Dada's books and lectures that talk about a little more generally about how you do that without a band structure. The contacts, as I said, have strong inelastic scattering. They maintain equilibrium. We assume that that's the only place that inelastic scattering occurs. So that's where the electrons exchange energy with the phonons and everything comes into thermal equilibrium. Uh, U is this self-consistent potential. So an electron sees the average potential from all of the other electrons. Right? That's a mean field theory. That's what we normally do in semiconductor device analysis. You know, there are some conditions under which th that's not good enough. And some examples are things like single electron charging, where that you have to take into account the discreteness of the electron and the interactions between the electrons much more carefully and not in this average sense. That's beyond the scope of what we're going to be talking about. And again, I'll refer you to some of Professor Dada's lectures where he discusses those effects. And finally, as I mentioned, the Electrons travel through the device elastically. They might scatter, but they don't change energy. They can only change energy when they get into the contacts and dissipate energy. So we have independent energy channels. We can ask ourselves what happens at each energy, and then to get the total current, we can integrate or add up all of the energy channels. So that's the assumption. Oh, and one more thing. We're going to assume th these contacts have a special nature. They're, they're perfectly absorbing or reflecting. So if an electron exits the device and goes into contact two, it gets absorbed and thermalizes. It doesn't reflect and come back into the device. You know, that helps us with the bookkeeping. You know, we know inside the device where the electrons come from. That's actually, in most cases, that's not a bad description of real contacts. You know, they are, you know, they are uh, very often very close to an absorbing contact. So even though this model might look simplified, you know, the experimental evidence is that it's actually quite good. Okay, so that's the model device. And we're just going to try to find out how many electrons are in it, how much current flows through it. So first step is to formulate the mathematical model. So we can, do, we can think of it this way. Let's assume that we only have the left contact attached. No current is going to flow, right? Electrons might flow out of the contact into the device, everything will settle down and we'll be in thermodynamic equilibrium. Okay, so if we do that, we can write some little equations. The number of electrons in the device when it's only connected to contact one the superscript zero tells me that I'm at equilibrium. We're just going to fill up the states in the device according to the Fermi level in the contact. Right? It'll just come to equilibrium. There'll be one Fermi level. It'll describe how all of the states are occupied, whether they're in the contact or the device. And if I want to know how long that will take, you know, if I attach it, it'll take a little bit for the charge to flow around and for that to happen. You know, the simplest equation that I could think of writing would be something like this. The rate of change of the electron number in the device is proportional to the difference between the equilibrium number that the contact wants to be there and 
the number that is actually there, and then divide it by this characteristic time. So if I don't have enough electrons in the device, this rate will be positive, and the contact will, electrons will flow from the contact into the device. If I have somehow started the process with too many electrons in the device, this rate will be negative, electrons will flow out of the device into the contact, and after a time, tau one, everything will settle down and be in equilibrium. Okay. Now, one of the things, as Professor Fisher mentioned, that there's always, you always have to keep the notation straight, and different people use different types of notation. So I need to just point out, you know, when you're reading books and papers and things, you have to be careful about various factors. How did the author do this or that? I'm going to always include the factor of two spin in the density of states, because that's typically the way we do it in semiconductor device textbooks and things. So we'll have to be careful about where these factors of two come in. All right, now, it's just as easy, if I had the device just connected to the second contact, then the device would want to come into equilibrium with the second contact. Again, no current would flow, it's only connected to one contact. So, I can write the same thing, the number of devices, the number of electrons in the device would be the density of states times the Fermi function of contact two. And the flow in or out to, main, to achieve that equilibrium would be described by this simple rate equation. Okay, so now in general we've got both contacts attached. And each one, you know, one contact has a voltage applied to it and the other one doesn't, so the Fermi levels are in different locations. So each contact wants to fill up the device in different ways. So I can simply add the rate that they flow in or out from contact one to the rate that they flow in or out from contact two, and I can add the two up. Now initially there will be a transient, but if I wait long enough, everything will settle down to steady state, and there will be no change with time. So I have an equation there that I can solve for the number of electrons in the device. It's the steady state number that will result. And the answer is this. It's some weighted average between what the two contacts would like to see in there in equilibrium. N1 superscript zero is the number of electrons in the device if it's in equilibrium with contact one. And N2 superscript zero would be the number of electrons in the device if it were in equilibrium with contact two. But we have two different Fermi levels that can't be in equilibrium with both contacts at the same time. So it's just some weighted average between the two. And the weights depend on how strong the connection is to the two contacts. If it's weakly connected to one contact, it'll mostly be determined by the other contact. If it's equally weighted, both of them will have equal weights. Okay, so just to remind you, N10 is just the density of states in the channel times the Fermi function of the contact. And this is a little nano device. You know, the channel is not in thermodynamic equilibrium. There is no Fermi function in the channel. The Fermi function always refers to the contacts. And to keep things simple for the rest of the lecture and all of the subsequent lectures, I'm going to assume that the two contacts are identical. These two times are the same. Okay, so we get a very simple answer. Actually, you know, surprisingly simple. The number of electrons, well, half the states are filled by contact one, or half the states are available to be filled by contact one. Half the states are available to be filled by contact two. You know, their contacts are equal. The densities of states are just going to divide up, split in half. But the weights are determined by the Fermi functions of contact one and contact two. So these are all independent energy channels. So if I want the total number of electrons, I just integrate over all of the channels. All right, all right now this is really, if you, if you remember, you know, one of the first things you learn in a semiconductor device course is how to compute the equilibrium number of electrons in the conduction band of silicon or whatever. It's just an integral of the density of states times the equilibrium Fermi function. All right. Now, we're out of equilibrium. 
We have two different contacts with two different biases. But the result is very similar. It's an integral of half of the density of states times the equilibrium Fermi function of the first contact plus half the, den the other half of the density of states times the equilibrium Fermi function of the second contact. So you can describe this out of equilibrium situation very much like we, very much like we describe the equilibrium situation. We just have to remember that there are two different Fermi levels, there are two different sets of states that are filling those, uh, being filled by those Fermi levels. Okay, um, one more thing in terms of, of notation that we'll have to keep straight. So, you know, the density of states is, if this is a three-dimensional channel, then if its volume is twice as big, there'll be twice as many states. So the density of states will be proportional to the volume. If the channel is a two-dimensional sheet, like a MOSFET inversion layer, then the density of states will be proportional to the area of the sheet. And if it's a nanowire, like a carbon nanotube, then the density of states will be proportional to the length of the nanotube. Normally, in semiconductor courses, we express densities of states as per unit volume or per unit area or per unit length and per energy as well. Well, right now, I'm not doing it. I'm doing it as total number because I'm asking for the total number of electrons. One of the advantages is I can do 1D, 2D, or 3D. You know, it's all the same. It's only at the end when I decide how I want to divide things up. And if I were doing it in 1D, I would ask for what's the density of electrons, but it would be the density per unit length. If it were 2D, we usually ask what's the sheet carrier density, the density per square centimeter. If I do it in 3D, I ask what's the density per cubic centimeter. It's just the number divided by volume. All right, so we'll keep that. So we were posing these two questions, and we've answered the first. So the second question then is how much current is flowing? And that we can answer too. So we'll go back to our model device, and we describe these two fluxes, this, this dn1 dt and dn2 dt. The contacts are, are either putting electrons into the device, F1 would be positive, or they're pulling it out, F1 would be negative. So both contacts are trying to fill up the device according to their Fermi level. And in steady state, the sum of the two has to be zero. Right? What comes in one contact just goes out the other contact. Okay. So if I want the steady state current, which is the only question I'm going to ask, we just solve that little equation. And now the current then will just be Q times the flux that's coming in the first contact. Um, let's say that's positive, then that same flux in steady state is going out the other contact, so it would be a negative flux, so it's minus Q times F2. Another notation thing, if you're, if you're in physics, you represent Q as the electron charge and it has a sign. If you're in electrical engineering, Q is the magnitude of the charge. So I'm an electrical engineer, so Q is the magnitude of the charge. I think physicists would write this as E, is the magnitude of the charge. You know, people can't agree, so you just have to keep track of it. Okay, so we have these expressions for the current. We have already formulated what the fluxes are. The equilibrium carrier densities are just products of density of states times Fermi function. So we'll just insert those quantities and those expressions. Let's see, I, I really have two equations there. I'm relating it in terms of the flux in contact one, which is equal and opposite to the flux in contact two. So if I add those two equations, I get two times the current, and then divide by two, I get the second expression. Then I just plug these quantities in, and I expand it a little bit, and we have an expression for the current. All right, just straightforward algebra. So we've answered our second question. You know, the current is 2q over h times gamma pi d over 2 f1 minus f2. So this is an equation. We want to get familiar with this. We're going to use this throughout the next eight lectures. I'm going to express this in slightly different form, but it will be the same equation. The important points here to remember, there have to be a difference in Fermi levels or current won't flow. 
if both contacts have the same Fermi energy, there's no reason for current to flow. The density of states, remember I included the factor of two in the density of states because that's the way most semiconductor people do it. So density of states divided by two is a density of states per spin. You might ask, why do I have a two out front and divided by two? It's because this is the way people like to write it. The two out front we think of as accounting for spin. The d divided by two is my density of states per spin. And then pi is just pi, and gamma is this broadening. Okay, so it's all, it's all very simple. All we have to do now for the rest of the lecture is just think about these terms a little bit. So the next thing I want to talk about is this concept of the number of channels for conduction, or also we'll call that, people call that modes. And we'll talk about why we call that modes. All right. So this is the expression we've derived. Just a few simple, straightforward arguments following the, the work that Professor Dada has done over the past few years. Now we have this expression. Now let's look at this and, and see if we can make some more sense of it. So we have this term gamma pi d over 2. You know, what is this? Well, gamma has the units of energy. Right? It's the broadening. Okay. Density of states has units of 1 over energy. Pi doesn't have any units. So this is some number, dimensionless. You know, what is it? Well, we're going to show that it is the number of channels for conduction at the energy E. And we'll have to see if we can see why that is. So, you know, everything that we're doing here we can do in 1D, 2D, and 3D. I, as I told you in my introduction, I'm mostly going to work out examples in 2D just because, you know, you'd get bored of seeing it done in all three dimensions and lots of problems involve 2D. So let's think of a sheet, like maybe the inversion layer of a MOSFET. So there, those are our two contacts. We have a two-dimensional density of states. So now just a little bit more notation. When I write d sub 2d, I'm going to mean the density of states that you find in the semiconductor textbooks. The number of states per square centimeter per electron volt. So the total density of states, which is d of e, is, is that quantity times the area of the channel. And that quantity, if you have parabolic bands and you've had a an introductory semiconductor course you've probably worked out. The density of states in 2D is effective mass over pi h bar squared. That's something we, we know. Okay, so let's see if we can figure out what this uh, gamma or tau is. And I think Professor Dada already discussed it so we know the answer, but we'll see it one more time. Okay, so these are our two expressions that we've developed for the current and for the number of electrons in the device. Now, let me divide the two. So what's on top is the total charge in the device. Q times N is the total amount of charge in the device. And I is the current. So I'll just divide those two. Okay, now let me apply a large enough voltage at contact two such that it lowers the Fermi level in contact two, such that it has no probability of occupying any states in the channel. Its Fermi level is pulled down so low. Okay. So now F2 is basically zero, and all of the electrons that come into the device come in from contact one. So I can simplify that expression, and you know, I get an F1 divided by an F1, so what we find is that the total charge in the device divided by the current is just this time tau. You know, dimensionally you can see that that's correct. Current is charge divided by time, so we're dividing charge by charge divided by time, it's got to be a time. This is what electrical engineers would call a charge control time, you know, commonly used to analyze devices. So that's what this tau is. And we can figure out what it is for our little nano device. So let's say, you know, if I look along this sheet, 
in the x direction from contact one to contact two, and I ask what is the density, it's going to be the sheet carrier, you know, the, the density in this device is uniform. One thing I should point out that usually, this is a small nano device, I'm only asking for the number of electrons in the device, or if it's a long one, it's under low bias, and the concentration of electrons is uniform. If I want to spatially resolve things inside the device, I have to get much more sophisticated. I could do a non-equilibrium Green's function simulation. I could solve a Boltzmann transport equation in space. Okay. But we're, we're assuming that the density of electrons is uniform inside the device. It's a short, small device. Right. So we have a density of electrons. We have a current. I can always write current as the product of charge times velocity. Right? That, that's pretty fundamental. The, uh, the charge is just the sheet carrier density times W times Q. The velocity, this is the average velocity in the direction of current flow. That's what this average Vx plus is. The average velocity flowing in the plus x direction. All right. That's almost a definition. So if I just divide those two quantities, I'll divide stored charge by the current, we find that this transit time is L divided by the length of the device divided by the average velocity that they're traveling at. That's the transit time. All right? And you saw that from Professor Dada. Right? We could have probably guessed that. Okay, so let's see what we have here. We have to be a little bit more careful. Professor Dada also mentioned that you might have to do some averaging over angles and things. If this were a 1D nanowire and everything was just moving in the X direction, we'd be done. But it's a 2D sheet. So electrons are coming in from contact one and they can have any angle between plus and minus pi over two. And we want the average velocity, the X directed velocity of those electrons that are moving in the XY plane. So the average velocity, so Vx is just V cosine theta, where V is the magnitude of the velocity. So I have to take the average value of cosine theta. Well, that's easy to do. Theta is distributed between minus pi over two and plus pi over two. So all of the incoming electrons are distributed over a range of angles of pi. So the average cosine theta is just two over pi. So this average velocity in the x direction is just two over pi times the magnitude of the velocity. And again, you know, I'm, I'm using parabolic bands over and over again, and the danger that you shouldn't let yourself fall into is, is thinking that any of this applies just to parabolic bands. That's why we have lecture 10 when, we, when we'll do graphene. So what's the magnitude of the velocity? In a parabolic band, one half mv squared is equal to energy. So the velocity is just proportional to the square root of kinetic energy. Right. Okay, so now we can go back to this question. Remember that the question is, what is this quantity m, the product of gamma pi d over two? Well, the broadening is just h bar over tau, and tau is L over the average velocity. Uh, the density of states, uh, we know also. So we find that the number of channels is just width proportional to the width. So that's kind of intuitive. The wider the channel is in the direction coming out of the page, the, the more channels there are. It's proportional to average velocity times density of states. So this is actually very general. If I want to find the number of channels, this is the way that I can do it. It's still not giving me a physical sense as to what these are, but this is a prescription that works all the time. In 1D, it's just h bar over four times the average velocity times the 1D density of states. In 2D, it's proportional to the width, and it's width times h bar over four, average velocity times dense, 2D density of states. And in 3D, it's a similar thing, but it's proportional to the cross-sectional area. Okay. But the question still is, what does this mean? You know, what, what, and why do we call them modes? You know, why do we call this number of channel modes? Okay, so, you know, we know what's in here. We know what the average velocity is. We know how it's related to energy. We know what the 2D density of states is for parabolic bands. So we can just 
plug everything in and we can work out an expression for what M is. And this is the expression. Okay, then the question is, what does that mean? All right. Well, if I look down here, for parabolic bands, I can solve for K. K is the wave vector of the electron waves, 2 pi over the Broglie wavelength, right? 2 pi over lambda. So I can solve that bottom equation on the right for K, put it back into my expression for M, and we find that M is WK over pi. Okay. I, it's getting simpler. Uh, k, the wave vector, is 2 pi over lambda. So m is the width of the channel divided by the half wavelength of the electron at that energy. Okay. So what does that mean? M is so now it's easy to re, to remember. It's just the number of half wavelengths that fit into w. So if I go back to my 2D conductor. If I assume that there's only one subband occupied in the z direction, then the question is how, you know, I have some finite width, so the wave function has to go to zero at the two edges of the channel. And, you know, how many channels are there associated with that finite width? Well, it's just w divided by a half a wavelength. So, look, if there's one, if m is equal to one, if there's one channel, it means that the half wavelength of the electron is just equal to the width. That means that, you know, the wave function has to go to zero at both sides, and the wave function fits in. Okay, what if there are two conducting channels? That means that the wavelength of the electron wave is W. That means something like this is the mode that fits in. Okay, okay. but I also have a mode like this that has a smaller wave vector in the y direction. That also fits in. So now I've got two different ky's that fit in. So each one of those is a separate channel for conduction, and that's why I have two channels for conduction. So this is why we call them modes. This looks like an electron waveguide. So people saw an analogy to waveguides. Uh, you, you establish the boundary conditions for electrons at the two um, boundary conditions, and it looks like a, a waveguide, like one for electromagnetics. So that's why we call these modes. You know, the number of channels is equal to the number of modes. Okay, so we have a simple physical interpretation. M is the number of electron half wavelengths that fit into W. That's what gamma, gamma pi density of states over two is. So let me just point out, the density of states is probably something you've all seen. Uh, you've worked it out for parabolic bands. You can work it out in 1D, 2D, or 3D. And you have these characteristic shapes. In 1D, it goes as 1 over the square root of energy, so it goes to infinity at the bottom of the band. In 2D, the density of states is constant for parabolic bands. In 3D, the density of states goes as the square root of energy. Okay, but now we have this other quantity, m. And m is just velocity times density of states. So if I work out m in 1D, 2D, and 3D, m is just constant. In 1D, if I have you know, one subband occupied, m is just 1. In 2D, it, it's proportional to the square root of energy, because as the width gets wider, more and more of these modes can fit into the width. And in 3D, it turns out to go linearly with energy. Okay, so you know, just to summarize, the density of states is probably something that you're all familiar with. When we want the number of electrons, we integrate the density of states times a Fermi function. Okay, now we have this number of modes or channels. We need to understand what it is because we integrate m when we want to find the current. And it's worth remembering that the, num that the two are related and that the number of modes is proportional to the average velocity in the direction of transport times the density of states. And it's also worth remembering, I showed you it's different in 1D, 2D, and 3D. But you shouldn't forget that it also depends on the dispersion of the band structure, because I assume parabolic bands in all three cases. If we go to graphene, You'll say, well, graphene is a 2D conductor. 
but its number of modes won't be what I just showed you because graphene doesn't have a parabolic band. So it depends on both. Okay, so continuing on. The next concept we have to talk about is transmission. And I remember Professor Fisher mentioned this. I think Professor Dada might have too, I don't recall now. That was, so let, let's talk about transmission. So back to our channel, you know, ballistic transport. Electrons just come in one contact and shoot across the other to the other and exit without any reflections. It's a perfectly absorbing contact. You know, they don't encounter anything to scatter from. But they might come in at an angle, and that's why we did that average over angle to get the average velocity in the x direction. That's ballistic transport. You know, if there is any scattering from the boundaries, we assume that the boundaries are atomically flat and it's specular scattering. So angle of incidence equals angle of reflection, and it doesn't have any effect on the current flow. In a real device, of course, there'll be roughness there and that'll be a scattering mechanism, but we're ballistic here. Now, what's diffusive transport? So I think Professor Dada discussed this a little bit too. So in diffusive transport, an electron comes in ballistically for a while, but then it encounters something, a charged impurity, a phonon, maybe a roughness at the edge of the sample, and it scatters in some random direction. And it undergoes a random walk, it gets a little ways and then it scatters again, and there's no assurance that it will come out contact two, but some of them do. Some of them turn around and go back out contact one. If I have applied a positive voltage on contact two, slightly more of them will come out of contact two than contact one. But this is what we mean by diffusive transport. Okay, so electrons undergo a random walk. Some terminate at contact one, some at contact two. The average distance between collisions is the mean free path. This is lambda. This is what Professor Fisher labeled with a capital lambda. I'm going to use a small lambda. Of course, I also use lambda for wavelengths, so you have to... But then I have a lambda b for de Broglie wavelength. So, you know, I don't know any nice solution. You know, it's actually helpful because you have to be sure you know what the meaning of these equations is because you, all right, you're never sure what the symbol means. Uh, diffusive transport just means the device is a lot longer than the mean free path. Now, since this broadening is gamma over transit time, it's going to take a lot longer for the electrons to get across the device when it's diffusive, right? It's much easier in ballistic, it just shoots across. So our transit time is going to be affected. And we have to figure out that. So we know what the average velocity is in the x direction for ballistic transport, that's easy to deduce. Now what is the average velocity for in the x direction when it's diffusive? And Professor Dada also mentioned this, but let's, let's do it one more time. So the way I'm going to do this is I'm, I'm, going to, I'm, I'm going to assume that we have a channel that is much longer than the mean free path, so I can go back and do classical things like fixed law diffusion. I know what the answer is, right? Because it's a diffusive sample. Okay. So I know that the current is just proportional, to, it's a diffusion coefficient times a, times a uh, gradient in the carrier concentration, just fixed law. And the minus sign is just because I've defined current to be positive when it flows in that second contact. Okay. So if you solve a problem like this, you're basically solving a diffusion equation, and you inject electrons in one contact, and we apply a positive voltage on the other so that the Fermi function is pulled way down and we, we don't inject any electrons from that contact, its Fermi level is too low, then the profile will look something like this. And you'll get this if you solve fixed law in the continuity equation. This is what you'll get. You'll get a linear profile. You might remember from semiconductor courses, if carriers recombine inside the region, this will be exponential. But if there's no recombination, it's just linear. Uh, we have some concentration at the beginning. Uh, the length is many mean free paths long. 
We have a contact at the other end that just lets carriers go out, but doesn't let any come in, so the concentration is very low. And the current, we, we can just say current flows down the concentration gradient. So it's just given by Fick's law. So what would this time tau be? You know, because, well, I'll just, I will just divide stored charge by current. The stored charge is the area under that rectangle. The current is just given by the slope of that line times the diffusion coefficient. If you divide those two, you get length squared over two times diffusion coefficient. Okay. Another notation thing. I also have a problem with Ds. You know, some Ds are densities of states. Some Ds are diffusion coefficients. All right. I write it D sub n because so you'll think of it as the electron diffusion coefficient. But of course, this works in a p-type sample too. But that's my notation. All right. So you know that, that's actually you know that's a very useful thing to remember. Many of you probably know that answer. How long does it take for particles to diffuse across a region? Length of the region squared divided by two times the diffusion coefficient. All right, so now we can go back. We have this parameter gamma in our current equation that we have to evaluate. And when we did it ballistically, it was just h bar divided by the ballistic transit time. When we do it diffusively, it's h bar divided by the diffusive transit time. All right. That's the only thing that'll change. The ballistic transit time is just L divided by the average ballistic velocity. The diffusive transit time is L squared divided by two times the diffusion coefficient. Now, we'll see this a little bit later. I'll, I'm just going to plop it in here now. The diffusion coefficient is related to the mean free path. And actually, you can show, and you know, we'll come back to this later in some, some other lectures, that the diffusion coefficient is the average velocity in the direction of transport times the mean free path divided by two. All right. That isn't intuitively obvious, but we'll see where it comes from. But at least you can see it's dimensionally correct. You know, velocity is centimeters per second, mean free path is centimeters, so it has units of centimeters squared per second. Okay, so we're trying to evaluate this broadening gamma sub d for diffusive transport. So let me write it as the ballistic quantity, h bar over ballistic transit time, times the ratio of ballistic transit time over diffusive transit time. Okay, So gamma for the diffusive case is just gamma for the ballistic case times this ratio of transit times. Okay, The ratio of transit times we have right here. We can just compute. And if you do that, you'll find that the diffusive gamma is mean free path divided by length times the ballistic gamma. And since we've assumed diffusive transport, the mean free path is much smaller than the length, so the diffusive transit time, or the diffusive broadening is much less than the ballistic broadening. Diffusive transit time is much greater than the ballistic transit time. Okay, so, you know, when we were computing current, we had this number, the number of channels was important. If we go back to our current expression, we have to replace gamma sub b, the ballistic quantity, with the diffusive quantity. So all we have to do, and you can see that the ballistic quantity is just the diffusive quantity times this ratio mean free path divided by length. So we can simply replace m in the ballistic case by the product of m times a number. Right? Gamma, or mean free path divided by L is just a number. That number we'll call T, transmission. And it's very much less than one for ballistic transit transport. It's just the ratio of the mean free path divided by the length. Professor Fisher used a similar expression. You used, you had some Greek letter squiggle or something for this. Okay, I'm using T. You, you'll notice earlier, I used T sub L for temperature. That's the temperature of the lattice. And since we're near equilibrium, the temperature of the lattice is also the temperature of the electrons. Because I wanted to use T for transmission. So it's another one of these notation things I have to worry about. Okay, so we can, we can take this expression that we could derive very simply. Current is 2Q over H times an integral of gamma pi d over 2 times F1 minus F2. 
and we can write it in an equivalent way. And this is the way I'm mostly going to use for these lectures. You know, it's, you know they're just algebraically the same. 2q over h times transmission times number of channels times f1 minus f2. Two different ways of saying the same thing. Okay, and in the diffusive case, that transmission we just saw was the ratio of lambda mean free path divided by length. In the ballistic case, t was just one. You know, it wasn't there. Now, a lot of problems these days are in this quasi-ballistic regime. You know, 10, 20 years ago, we were almost always in the diffusive regime. And people did experiments in mesoscopic physics where they were in the ballistic regime. These days, at room temperature in practical electronic devices, we're frequently in between those two, and sometimes we're actually quite close to ballistic. So you're in this regime where you're not quite sure which is the best assumption. And as Professor Dada mentioned, that this is almost considered two different topics. There are people that work on ballistic transport and use Landauer approach for that. There are people that work on diffusive transport and use drift diffusion equations or Boltzmann equations for that. But there's really no reason, I mean, it's just transport. There's no reason to artificially divide these into two separate, to use two separate approaches for them. And in fact, this will seem ad hoc right now, but it's not. If, if I write t as mean free path over mean free path plus length, you can see that it has the proper answer in both limits. When L is much longer than the mean free path, it gives what it needs to give for the, ballist, for the diffusive case. When the length is much shorter than the mean free path, it gives one, which is the answer in the ballistic case. Now, it's actually, you know, it's actually not an ad hoc thing to give me the correct answer between the two endpoints, but Professor Fisher had a reference to Professor Dada's, um, what is it, 1995 book on electronic conduction. You can derive this, and we'll do that in lecture six. It actually works continuously from diffusive to ballistic and anywhere in between. So it gives you a very nice technique. That, that's one of the reasons that we like this method, is we can, we can treat transport from both limits and in between with one way of doing that. Okay, so just a couple of more things, and uh, and we'll be ready to call it a day. So we have this expression for the current. You know, I can write it in a couple of different ways. This is the way I'll mostly be doing it. And, and there are many problems in which we use the expression this way, but that's not the subject of the, of the next eight lectures that I'm going to talk about. The next eight lectures are about near equilibrium transport. So near equilibrium transport means that we apply a small voltage or a small temperature difference, and F1 and F2 are not very much different. That's what we mean by near equilibrium transport. So since F1 and F2 are not very different, we can linearize it. Now let's see how you do that. We know what F1 and F2 are. For the time being, we're going to assume same temperatures for the both of the contacts. When we let the temperatures be different, we get thermoelectric effects. So I can expand F2 as a Taylor series expansion. It's F1 plus some small additional amount. So that's the derivative of F1 with respect to the Fermi level times the difference in the Fermi levels. Because right, the two temperatures are the same. The only thing that's different between the two contacts is they have different Fermi energies. That's all. Now, energy is minus Q times voltage for electrons. So the difference in Fermi energy is coming because I've applied a positive voltage to the right side. So delta EF is minus Q times V. Now also, if you look at these Fermi functions, you can see E and EF energy and the Fermi energy kind of come in similar ways. The only difference is one has a negative sign. So I could just as easily write DF, DEF, or, D, or minus DF, D energy. Same thing. Okay, so the result of doing all of that is that when I linearize this difference, F1 minus F2, I find it's just proportional to the voltage. This is what's going to give me near equilibrium transport. 
And the bottom line then is that we can simplify that expression, for general expression we had for current into an expression for small differences in the two Fermi functions or small applied voltages. We get this expression. So you know, the key factor now is this minus dF dE. This has become an F naught because we're near equilibrium. So F1 is close to the equilibrium Fermi function, F0. F2 is close to the equilibrium. They're just a little bit different. Okay, so that's linear transport. So I want to mention here just briefly, again, this is a topic, Professor Dada touched on this, so we can, uh, well, we should mention it again here. Um, most transport theory, if, if you look at traditional books from the 50s, 60s, 70s, probably 80s too, near equilibrium transport is all about transport in the bulk. It means a, a structure that is many mean free paths long and you don't even think about the contacts. You know? Ballistic transport, you, you have to think about contacts. Everything is determined by the contacts. So let's see how we connect to traditional transport theory. We have this expression, you know, uh, we know what the broadening is. For diffusive transport, the transit time is L squared over 2D. The density of states in this expression is the total density of states per energy. So I can write it as the density of states per energy per square centimeter times the area of the sheet. Now the current, this is one of these little careful. Normally when we're doing these little devices, we apply a positive voltage to the second contact. The current, if the current flows in, we call that a positive voltage. That's the way we, circuit, people call that the circuit convention. But if my x-axis points in the other direction, then that's a current flowing in the minus x direction. So if I want a current equation, I have to worry about that minus sign. And then we'll expand this for small differences in the Fermi level. So I'll get this. And we'll lump things together here. So now I have the current is proportional to a diffusion coefficient. That diffusion coefficient came in here from the transit time, which was L squared over two diffusion coefficient, uh, times a density of states per unit energy per square centimeter, times a minus the FDE. And then when we expand F1 minus F2, we ended up with a delta Fn over L. Remember, F sub n is the difference between the Fermi levels of the two contacts. And now in a bulk sample, I'm going to think about it a little differently, and we're going to think about it as a position-dependent quasi-Fermi level. So delta Fn over L, that's like a derivative. So it's a small step now to lump everything in the curly brackets, I'll call that conductivity, to take delta Fn over L and call that a gradient of the quasi-Fermi energy. And I get this expression for current density. J is equal to conductivity times the gradient of the quasi-Fermi energy divided by Q, so it has units of volts. Okay. So that's a classic textbook description of low field transport. Current is proportional to the gradient of the electrochemical potential or quasi-Fermi level, whatever we call it. And we've got that. We've got that, we got that just by taking our small nano device and making it very, very long, so there was many mean free paths long, and what comes out is this. And we have this expression for conductivity. And remember, Professor Dada showed this also. So this, this is actually a little better than n q mu, where mu is q tau over m. And you see, you see this in standard textbooks too. The conductivity is an integral of the diffusion coefficient at energy E and the density of states at energy E weighted by this minus dFdE. Okay. So in a bulk sample like this, we'll apply a voltage. The voltage will just tilt the conduction band so it will have a constant slope. The quasi-Fermi level will be parallel if there are no diffusion currents there. And that's our picture. Now how do we, how do we think about what we're doing here? And this is the thing, like Professor Dada said, we have to be a little bit careful. Because conceptually, the way we think about this is we have this long bulk device. It's near equilibrium everywhere. And instead of thinking about inelastic scattering occurring only in the contacts and elastic scattering occurring in between, we just go into a chunk of this infinitely long material 
and we'll say, okay, we'll say all of the inelastic scattering occurs in these two shaded regions. Those we're going to think of as our contacts. And in between, we can have the elastic scattering. On average, if, we're a, if it's a long device, everything will average out just fine. You know, it's not actually separated this way, but we can conceptually think of it that way. We have to be careful about those contacts because as we'll discuss tomorrow morning in the first lecture, and as Professor Dada mentioned, there is this quantum contact resistance. But in any device, there are only two real contacts, and you can't add up those quantum contact resistances at each little dx of the infinite device. They only come at the end. You know. But that's an easy. So, you know, if we just take our normal little expression for this nano device, make it many free, mean free paths long, we get the classic expression that everybody has known for probably more than 50 years about what the current flow is. Okay. So that's a very fundamental description. Okay, now I can do one more thing. If you're, if you're an electrical engineer, you know about drift diffusion equations. So sometimes we do this backwards. Sometimes we start with a drift diffusion equation and show that the equation on the top left can be derived from it, but that's not, not the way to do it. The equation on the top left is really a very fundamental description of current flow. But if I look at that, so let me think about a, a 2D semiconductor. Let me assume that it's non-degenerate. So the carrier density can be expressed as an effective density of states, capital N sub 2D, times an exponential of the difference between the quasi-Fermi level and the bottom of the conduction band. Okay. Uh, the effective density of states is given by that expression. So I can solve the top equation then for the quasi-Fermi energy, F sub N, or electrochemical potential. And then I can take its gradient and plug it in for the gradient on the first expression. And I could write conductivity as nq mu. And if you do all of that and put it together, this is the current the equation that you'll get. We've just now separated things out. The first term is what we call the drift term. The second term is what we call the diffusion term. The diffusion coefficient is a thermal velocity in the x direction times a mean free path divided by two. The mobility is given by an Einstein relation. Right? It's just a classic drift diffusion equation. So drift diffusion equations are, are not fundamental, but I just wanted to connect them to something you've probably seen before. They do assume that you're near equilibrium. We can't get around that. Uh, they also assume that we're at constant temperature. You know, Later on in uh, tomorrow or Wednesday morning, we'll talk about what a drift diffusion equation looks like when there's a temperature gradient as well. Uh, I did it for Maxwell Boltzmann statistics here, but there was no reason I had to do that. I, I could have used Fermi Dirac statistics, and I just would have gotten a more complicated Einstein relation. Okay. All right, so that's the drift diffusion equation. Now, another thing we should ask about is what about holes? You know, in thinking about this, I've been sort of thinking about electrons flowing through the conduction band, and I've written a quasi-Fermi level for the conduction band. Now, you know, in many semiconductors, we have a band gap. For silicon, it's about 1.1 eV. And we usually have two different electrochemical potentials, or two different quasi-Fermi levels. Now, F sub n is the quasi-Fermi level for electrons in the conduction band. And the assumption is that the electrons are distributed in energy according to a near equilibrium distribution, a Fermi Dirac distribution. It's just that instead of the equilibrium Fermi energy, we put in the quasi-Fermi level. Now, the holes are not necessarily in equilibrium with the electrons in the conduction band. Right? We might be shining light on this, and we might have vastly increase the number of both electrons and holes. Okay. So we need two separate quasi-Fermi levels, one to describe the population of the valence band and one to describe the population of the conduction band. Now, you might ask, you know, how do we compute the conductivity in the valence band? You know, and here you could, you know, you could get yourself you know, turned around easily, you could start thinking that, well, I shouldn't be talking about F 
the Fermi function, I should be talking about 1 minus f, and I should be thinking about holes. But it turns out you don't have to. You know, these are the expressions we got. And what happens to these expressions when the conduction is occurring through the valence band? We just replace the subscript n with the subscript p, and we don't change anything else. Right? Yeah, that that f there is the Fermi function. And if you think of that, you know, in, in the model when we talked about it, in the model that Professor Dada talked about this morning, you know, you had a Fermi level and one contact, you had a Fermi level at another contact. If there were states in between, you, you had current flow because electrons were flowing through those states. If the electrons are flowing through the conduction band states, we call that N type. If the electrons are flowing through the valence band states, we call that p-type. We don't have to think about holes. It's electrons flowing in both cases. So all of the expressions that we have work for either electrons or for holes. Or in some cases, you know, we have bipolar conduction. We have both occurring at the same time. We just integrate over both bands. So from time to time in these lectures, you know, I'll stop and you know, there's things like Seebeck coefficients are positive for n-type and negative for p-type. We'll talk, we'll stop and talk about that momentarily. But I won't be saying a whole lot about, about holes because, you know, everything I'm saying about electrons, you can evaluate parameters for holes in just the same way. Okay, so let's summarize and then see if there are any questions. So the key idea to keep in mind is that Current flows whenever there's a difference in Fermi levels, or if it's a bulk material, wherever there's a gradient in the electrochemical potential. Um, we developed these really simple expressions for how we compute the current flow that are remarkably useful. You know, they're very, very simple, but in practice they turn out to apply to a wide class of problems uh, very simply. And these are equivalent. So I can go back and forth, whichever one is most convenient for the uh, problem at hand. I'm primarily going to use the one on the bottom for the, for the rest of the lectures. Now, for small applied biases, we just expand F1. It's just a little bit different from F2. We just expand it, and then we get current is proportional to voltage. If we only have a temperature difference, we'll get current is proportional to the temperature difference. But it'll be linear, and we'll get expressions like this. Uh, if we want to go to the bulk, then we just let the conductor be many mean free paths long, and we naturally recover the conventional expressions for current flow in a bulk material. Okay, and I'll just point out that uh, you know I've tried to convey this as simply and as clearly as I could. Uh, this is the conceptual basis, and we're going to work out the consequences of all of this in the, in the next several lectures. Uh, for those of you that are interested in going more deeply into this, there's much more that can be said, and Professor Dada's notes are the best references. I think those of you that have a flash drive have two or three chapters from your from the volume that's coming out, I believe, that, are, that talk much, much more about the fundamentals about these concepts. Uh, if you want even more information, they can refer you to several lectures of Professor Dada. I can also refer you to my, my uh, course on the NanoHub if you want to see how to work out densities of states and things like that. Let's discuss there a little bit. But that's pretty much it. Okay, so thanks for hanging in there. It's been a long day. Right, thank you. So if there are any questions, uh, we can take them now. Yes. I wanted to ask a, a, a question from this gamma factor. Uh, the beginning of the talk was presented as a, a coupling parameter between the channel and the interface. Later on, uh, you discussed the diffusive channel. You related uh, this gamma parameter with uh, uh, the diffusion coefficient and the length of the conductor. So my question is, uh, if the uh, the interpretation of gamma has changed. So, yeah. so you're, you're, that's a good question. You're paying close attention to what I'm saying. Well, I hoped I had done that quickly enough, but 
But it's a, it's a very, it's a very good question. And, and we can, I can ask Professor Dada to comment if he likes to. If you're thinking about, if you're trying to compute the IV characteristics of a molecule, I think you would think of these tau 1 and tau 2 as the escape time. You put an electron on a molecule, this is how long it takes to get out. If you're trying to think about the, the current flow through a carbon nanotube or something, then the longest time is probably the time it takes to travel across the device, and the relevant time becomes a, a transit time. So I think the physical interpretation of that particular time probably depends on which problem you're, you're thinking about. Is that, is that the way you would think about it? Yeah. Usually thought of it as the time it takes to get from one contact to another, and a major part of it could be the interfaces, or it could be the yeah. In all of these things, you're assuming you have great contact. Mm -hmm. the real time is of yeah. the time. Yeah. Good. Yes. Another question. Uh, first five or ten minutes, you said that we are uh, looking at the steady state, state. So everything we made was for the steady state. And you said we connect the channel to the first contact and the channel to the second contact. Yeah. And then you sum up that and you said that it is zero. Then you uh, turn to the uh, bias bended uh, case. But I don't understand why you apply the steady state results to the uh, biased state. Okay, so the, the question is. You know, under bias, why do we make the steady state assumption? Is, uh, euro, euro, for example, F1 plus F2 is zero. Mm -hmm. Why is zero? On, for example, in the slide number 10. Slide number what? 10? 10. Let's take a look. This one? Is this the right one? Yes, this is you see the uh, zero and yeah. I don't understand. If you uh, connect the channel to the both contacts, I think it will not be zero. So your your question is why why is this zero? So th th that's just a def you know, out of equilibrium, um, we can still be in steady state. It just means when I apply the bias and waited long enough, everything will settle down. There will be some constant current, and there will be some constant number of carriers in there. Now, it doesn't mean that things aren't happening in time. The electrons are continually coming in one contact and continually going out the other. But, you know, the electron density has settled down. You know, the system will settle itself down until it, it reaches a steady state value. So, so, you know, this would occur in equilibrium, but it also occurs if I just have a problem where nothing is changing in time and I'm out of equilibrium. And so these are all, so all of the, you know, sometimes people ask, well, what about, you have an electronic device and you're switching it, you know? So, so these are, you know, these are all steady state. They're assuming after the switching event, you wait long enough until everything settles down and the current is constant. And these are the problems that we're trying to understand. In most devices, you know, if, if you operate very, very quickly, um, you may be able to see, see frequency limitations in transistors because the time, these transit times, the time it takes for an electron to go from the source to the drain starts to become an appreciable time if you have a rapidly varying AC signal going on. And if you go to extremely high frequencies, you can sometimes see some of these effects. But, yes? So we interpreted predict M as the number of means. Mm -hmm. But when we actually calculate it, do we always get an integer? What does it really mean when we don't get an integer? So the question is, we think of M as the number of modes, but do we get an integer? Um, if the structure is very small, then you can just count the number. And sometimes if you have a nano wire or you have a very narrow nano ribbon, you might have four, five, 10, 12 modes, and it's 
you can see its discreteness and you can just count them. Now, as the channel gets wider and wider and more and more half wavelengths can fit into it, you just get more and more and it starts to look like a continuous quantity. So if you have a wide structure, then you don't attempt to count them. You know. But in principle, there are a finite number there. It's just, it's just they're so closely spaced you can't count them. So does this interpretation apply to diffuser transport as well? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the picture we have is that we have the same channels for conduction in diffusive transport. It's just that the probability that an electron that comes into that channel, the probability that it goes out the other side is now much smaller. But the number of channels is the same. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question on this slide. Mm -hmm. So you made an assumption that tau 1 is equal to tau 2. Yeah. And you got DE over 2 terms in your expressions. Yeah. So if you don't make that assumption, then you'll get some terms uh, as a function of tau 1 and tau 2, right, in your expression. Right, right. So, but if, uh, like, what the argument that Professor Dutta gave in the morning, uh, that why we have a DE by 2 term. Why, why we have? DE divided by 2 term mm -hmm. in the expression. He said that it's because it's the plus k states have, like, half, half of the states are plus k states and half of them are minus k states, right? Yeah. So how do we interpret these two? Uh, yeah. I mean, you can just see from the math here that if tau 1 and tau 2 um, are equal, they're going to split in half. And then, then, you, then you say physically what's going on. And, and you can see in the ballistic case, you can see why it happens. The electrons come in from contact 1 and they're flowing in a positive direction. They can only occupy the plus k, the plus k states and only half of the states are that way. And in the other way, if they come in from the other contact, they only can come in with a negative velocity, so there are only half of the states that they can occupy. But even when there's diffusive scattering and it's all mixed up, uh, you're still going to, if the contacts are the same, they're still going to divide that way equally. Yeah. But in the ballistic case, like if tau 1 is not equal to tau 2, yeah. then we'll get some, like we'll not get the E over 2. That, that's right, and I think I think professor, you know, people that worried about molecular conductors several years ago, it was very difficult for them to make the two contacts identical, and they would see asymmetries in the IV characteristics that they frequently attributed to the fact that one contact was much worse than the other. So you, they could see effects that are, were attributed to that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, like 18. 18. Okay, this one? Yes, maybe you explain your agnostic, but why uh, the, the problem occurs, and then why do we have to do with how? So the question you're asking is, why does, why does the broadening occur? Yeah. yeah. Why does it have something to do with tau? And how is it related to tau? Yeah. All right, so there, there are two answers I can give to this. You know, one is that, you know, and that previous slide 10 that we were looking at, when I just went through the description, you know, and my, we characterized our device by these two times, tau 1 and tau 2, which told us something about how fast charge could move in and out. I could have done everything in terms of tau and never even brought up gamma, right? right. I just, I just introduced it at that stage as an equivalent way. I mean, it said gamma is equal to h bar over tau. Okay, but that's not quite, it actually does have a physical significance. I mean, and if you think, so you, you think back again to if this little device is a molecule, there's always, there's this uncertainty relation, delta E, delta T is greater than H bar. So if you have a molecule, it has discrete energy levels. If you attach it to two contacts and it's now attached to the outside world, the energy levels broaden. If you want to estimate how much the energy levels broaden, you use this uncertainty relation. You say delta E is H bar over the average time that an electron spins in one of those levels. So you can give that physical interpretation to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, 
you didn't say too much about uh, Lambda, how to calculate Lambda over P. Uh, yeah. Nice. See, I'm, I'm giving you some incentive to stay for the rest of the lectures. Yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't. So, you know, one of the questions is, what is the mean free path? And how do you calculate the mean free path? That's going to be important. I'm going to do two or three lectures here where I'm just going to assume that some smart person has calculated the mean free path and given it to us. So it's just a given quantity. Uh, but in lecture six, we'll talk about scattering. I'll talk about where that comes from and how you compute it. Yeah. How far do you push this way by doing, instead of talking about a MOSFET, what if I push the gradient by this way out? How, how, how would this model uh, fare in that case? Um, so are you you're concerned about pushing it in terms of applied voltages that you, yeah. 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 Right. So in the next lecture, you know, we'll analyze some MOSFET characteristics. And where this really applies is down near VD is near zero. You know, the initial part of a MOSFET characteristic, it operates like a voltage-controlled resistor. Right? That's where this applies to. And we can get some uh, estimate of what the mean free path is of electrons in the channel, you know, by analyzing that region. Now, if you go up to higher biases, um, you can still develop a model. You might know this little model that I've published. Uh, it's just that the F1 minus F2, you, you can't use a Taylor series expansion for it, because now F2 is much, much different than F1. But you can, but you can use these concepts and uh, develop a Landauer theory of the MOSFET that works under higher bias. So if you look at, I think, the first summer school on our electronics from the bottom up web page, you'll see, it, you know, I had a set of lectures there on, on that approach. Yeah. No. I think I might do it again next summer. You should come back next summer. <laughs> okay, any other questions? All right, thanks for hanging in there. Well, we have one more? One more? All right. Question uh, you, about the poles. And yeah. So we change the prescriptions, and uh, if you change the prescription for the Fermi, Fermi energy, for the Fermi energy for poles? No. See, this is the point. You have to be very careful. So you can get in. You can get very confused about holes. And my, my, the point I was trying to make is those expressions that I developed. They describe electron flow, whether the electrons are flowing through the conduction band or through the valence band. Now, if you're going to say, I don't want to think about electrons flowing in the valence band, I prefer to think about holes in the valence band, then you have to go through and you have to redo these things and, and you have to be very, very careful that you don't make any mistakes. But my point is you don't have to do any of that. It applies for electrons flowing through the conduction band or electrons flowing through the valence band. If you want the conductivity of a p-type material, you use the same expressions, the same Fermi function, not a 1 minus f. It all... And the Fermi level? Well, if I'm out of equilibrium, it would be the quasi-Fermi level for, for the valence band, or quasi-Fermi level for holes, if you want. Right? You, might, you, you know, when you're out of equilibrium in a semiconductor device, you have two different electrochemical potentials. So if you're talking about electrons flowing in the conduction band, use the electron quasi-Fermi level. If you're talking about electrons flowing in the valence band, you use the whole quasi-Fermi level. Right? Yeah. Okay.